A major harmful algal bloom has been occurring in the coastal waters adjacent the mouth of the River Murray, one of Australia's major rivers for the last few months. An algal bloom is a term used to describe significant and abnormally high growth in algae and plankton that is otherwise at the base of the food chain in the oceans. It has been responsible for the deaths of fish, crustaceans and seagrass, among other things, from the mouth all the way around the coast of the Gulf of St Vincent and affecting the coast of world-renowned Kangaroo Island. The area affected also includes the coast of the city of Adelaide. Adelaide is one of the two cities likely to host the 31st Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, COP31, in November of 2026. This is somewhat ironic, and I'll return to the climate change implications in a moment. In around March of this year, local surfers began complaining of itchy eyes after being in the ocean, and people began noticing dead fish washed up onto the shore of beaches in the area. Here are some photos that I took earlier in August of this year. It is really quite devastating to see such widespread death of marine life. The fish die because the algae consumes most of the available oxygen and then also clogs the gills of the fish. The algae also blocks the sunlight in the ocean, which starves seagrass of the solar energy needed for photosynthesis. During a visit to Kangaroo Island on the 20th of August 2025 to inspect the ecological devastation, Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese said, in quotes, climate change is real and that's why we're acting to deal with the damage today and take real action for the future. The Prime Minister's comments have raised the question of what role, if any, climate change has played in this algal bloom crisis. This is among the things we are going to explore in today's episode. Other questions we are going to explore are what are algal blooms and what causes them? Are they isolated phenomena or can they occur anywhere in the world? And importantly, how can algal blooms be managed or even prevented? Algal blooms are intensely complex ecological events. It is therefore important to refer to the scientific evidence when we try to answer these questions. For this reason, we're going to take a slightly different approach in today's video. I'm going to share some findings from scientific journal papers I have reviewed. Journal papers are all peer-reviewed, which means that they are not published until the journal has feedback from other scientists on the validity of the findings. The peer review process is not a guarantee that scholarly papers are without error, but it does provide a high level of assurance on the scientific defensibility and validity of the findings. What I will present today are findings from about 10 journal papers on algal blooms, some of which are brand new, published earlier this year, and others go back decades. I am also a journal editor myself. The journal is actually called Discover Sustainability, and I regularly review manuscripts for about 10 other journals. I am therefore going to bring a semi-scientific approach to today's video, a literature review of sorts. I hope you enjoy it. If you find it helpful, please let me know in the comments section below. The first question we're going to consider is what are the causes of an algal bloom? In essence, blooms are caused by a buildup of nutrients in freshwater systems like rivers and are then discharged into the ocean. Algal blooms also can occur within rivers themselves and in the deep ocean. When I say nutrients, I mean things like fertilizers and other soil treatments. Let's look at what some of the papers actually say. A paper by Selner et al. in 2003 said that, in quotes, elevated nutrient loading has been proposed as the primary reason for increasing harmful algal blooms. Low salinity coastal waters throughout the world are experiencing substantial increases in halotolerant cyanobacteria in response to elevated nutrient loading stemming from human activities. Next, a paper by Schleyer and Vardy in 2020 stated that, in quote, 
algal blooms are ephemeral events of rapid proliferation of phytoplankton, leading to the formation of dense assemblages of diverse aquatic ecosystems, including freshwater rivers, lakes, polar regions, coastal waters, and open oceans. The same authors also said, in quote, it is generally accepted that an algal bloom is initiated as a result of numerous environmental factors. These factors include physical, such as turbulence and light, chemical, which includes nutrient availability, and biological, relief of grazing pressure. In 2024, Lan et al. published a paper stating marine eutrophication, primarily driven by nutrient overinput from agricultural runoff, wastewater discharge and atmospheric deposition, leads to harmful algal blooms that pose severe threats to marine ecosystems. And according to the Oxford Dictionary, eutrophication means excessive richness of nutrients in a lake or other body of water, frequently due to runoff from the land, which causes a dense growth of plant life. The same authors also said in that paper, the dominance of these blooms is typically driven by environmental conditions such as nutrient enrichment, water temperature, light availability, and water column stratification. In a paper by Hodgkin and Hamilton in 1993, the authors say that an excess of plant nutrients has caused serious eutrophication in aquatic ecosystems of southwestern Australia, manifested by excessive growth and accumulation of green and blue-green algae. The paper summarises a range of other papers on the question of how to fertilise land without causing eutrophication. As we can see from the papers considered, human activity that sees nutrients make their way into waterways is a critical component of what actually causes algal blooms. Other factors include light available to support algal growth and also the water temperature. The next question we want to consider is whether algal blooms occur only in specific and limited locations or can they occur anywhere in the world? To answer this question, let's go back to the paper by Lan et al. in 2024. The authors of this paper looked at algal bloom case studies from a wide selection of locations. These included the Gulf of Mexico, or the Gulf of America, as it has now been labelled by President Trump, the North Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, the North Sea, the Baltic Sea, the Mediterranean, the South China Sea, the Caribbean, the Adriatic, the East Siberian Sea, the Bay of Bengal, the Black Sea, among others. As we can see, this offers a very wide geographical spread. It suggests algal blooms are very much a global phenomenon. It is equally clear that algal blooms can affect oceans as well as freshwater systems and coastal waters, albeit the causes remain the same, that is, higher nutrient levels resulting from human activity. The next question with which we're going to deal is what does climate change have to do with an algal bloom? Let us recall the words of the Australian Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese. Climate change is real, and that's why we're acting to deal with the damage today, to take real action for the future. So is there a link to climate change? And if so, what exactly is it? In 2015, Wells et al. said that climate change pressures will influence marine planktonic systems globally and it is conceivable that harmful algal blooms may increase in frequency and severity. Notice that Wells et al. used the word conceivable and not certain. The same authors went on to say that fundamental changes in harmful algal blooms research will be necessary if such blooms science is to obtain compelling evidence that climate change has caused alterations in harmful algal bloom distributions, the prevalence or character, and to develop the theoretical, experimental, and empirical evidence explaining the mechanisms underpinning these ecological shifts. Later in 2020, Schleyer and Vardy said that since phytoplankton are at the foundation of the entire aquatic food web, it is crucial to assess the effect of climate change on the biogeography, timing, and composition of algal blooms, and as a result of other trophic levels and large-scale 
biogeochemical cycles. Later still, in 2022, Tewari found that due to the complexity of biogeochemical climate interactions for different harmful algal bloom types and locations, there are still large uncertainties about the precise linkages between climate change and specific harmful algal blooms. The same author then went on to say that due to climate change, some species of harmful algae might become more successful in areas that are impacted by climate change compared to others which may actually diminish. This is due to the land runoff, water column stratification and other parameters. The author also stated that only a few long-term records exist of any algal blooms at any single locality as required for any climate change study, for studies related to the connection of harmful algal blooms and climate change, a long record of data sets is required. In a 2020 paper, Gerbler stated, climate change is transforming aquatic ecosystems. Coastal waters have experienced progressive warming, acidification and deoxygenation that will intensify this century. At the same time, there is a scientific consensus that the public health, recreation, tourism, fishery, aquaculture and ecosystem impacts from harmful algal blooms have all increased over the past several decades. Gerbler also found that the extent to which climate change is intensifying these harmful algal blooms is not fully clear, but there has been a wealth of research over the last few decades on this topic. The author also noted that the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, and their special report on ocean and cryosphere in a changing climate from September 2019 was the first IPCC report to directly link harmful algal blooms to climate change. In the summary for policymakers, the report made the following declarations with a high level of confidence. The first being, Harmful algal blooms display range expansion and increased frequency in coastal areas since the 1980s in response to both climatic and non-climatic drivers such as increased riverine nutrients runoff. The observed trends in harmful algal blooms are attributed partly to the effects of ocean warming, marine heat waves, oxygen loss, eutrophication and pollution. In another interesting twist, in a paper published earlier this year by Scholz et al, it appears algal blooms can also contribute to greenhouse gas emissions. In other words, limiting algal blooms ought to be part of overall climate change targets and mitigation actions. The authors stated that the science of greenhouse gas emissions from inland waters has evolved in recent years and we gained a greater appreciation for the contributions of aquatic methanogenesis to the atmospheric greenhouse gas budget. Furthermore, the authors say that it has been estimated that natural lakes and reservoirs, both freshwater and saline, emit greenhouse gases at a rate almost equivalent to 20% of all fossil fuel emissions with an upward trend. And while a portion of these emissions derives from natural or non-anthropogenic processes, a recent study notes that lake eutrophication, particularly that stemming from phosphorus loading, increases emissions considerably. It appears from the literature that we've considered here that there are some links to climate change, particularly from the potential contribution to warmer water temperature, though the precise nature of these links remains uncertain. The final question we're going to address today is about how algal blooms can be prevented or at least slowed down. Algal blooms inevitably end when the nutrient levels, sunlight and water temperatures change. But the question is, what can be done to minimise the marine harm that they cause? In a paper published all the way back in 1992, Holograif found that the management of nutrient discharges to inland and coastal waterways is crucial to arrest the increasing impact of harmful algal blooms. The personnel responsible for management decisions on pollutant loadings of rivers and coastal waters, including decisions on agricultural and forestry practices in catchment areas, should be made fully aware that one of the probable outcomes of increased 
nutrient loading will be an increase in harmful algal blooms. The same author also went on to say that other land uses were perhaps more suited to the coastal plain environment. Trees and other deep-rooted plants lower the water table and reduce water and nutrient loss to drainage. Some 30 years later, in 2023, Devlin and Brody found that enrichment of both nitrogen and phosphorus is of concern, though the consensus that has evolved among much of the scientific community is that increased nitrogen is the primary driver of eutrophication in many coastal ecosystems. However, this has been challenged by recent scientific literature, which acknowledges the need to reduce both nitrogen and phosphorus to control coastal eutrophication. The same authors then found that successful reductions of phosphorus have occurred throughout freshwater systems through the banning of phosphorus in detergents, and a corresponding reduction in phosphorus is being measured in many coastal waters. And while this is a hopeful trend, this has led to a global nitrogen to phosphorus imbalance in our coastal and marine ecosystems, and an increasing nitrogen to phosphorus ratio which can impact the plankton community structure and phosphorus limitation of natural growth. It would appear from the papers considered here in this video that it is the flow of nutrients into waterways that becomes the top priority for managing algal blooms. As Halagrayev said all the way back in 1992, the management of nutrient discharges to inland and coastal waterways is crucial to arrest the increasing impact of harmful algal blooms. Yet, here we are in 2025, and there has been very little scholarly research to suggest that the author was wrong. It is also interesting that changing the use of floodplains near rivers using deep-rooted trees can assist not only in arresting nutrient runoff, but also salinity. So there we have it, folks. That is a consolidated look at some of the scholarly literature on algal blooms and what it has to say in response to the questions we posed. If this were an actual literature review for a journal article, we would probably need to look at more papers, something more like 50 or 60. But today's limited review does provide a reasonable basis for at least being well informed. While climate change is in all probability a factor, it does not appear to be as important as the need to deal with human-induced nutrient flows into waterways when it comes to dealing with and managing harmful algal blooms. The algal bloom which is currently affecting the coast of South Australia will likely have come to an end by the time thousands descend upon Adelaide if indeed it is chosen as the venue for COP31 in November next year. However, how Australia responds to the current crisis will no doubt be of interest to international stakeholders equally as it is to local communities affected by the algal bloom. But what do you think about the current situation? Let me know what you think in the comments section below. If you've liked the video, please don't forget to hit like, subscribe to the channel and share the video with your colleagues, family and friends. On that note, I'd like to thank you for your attention today and I look forward to seeing you again soon in the next episode of Climate Mundial's Energy and Climate Weekly. Bye for now.